Hi, this is Jane Albright. I am taking a brief break from my Christmas decorating to read you an Oziana story. This is one that I wrote. I actually started writing this when I was like 12, 13. I was still babysitting and I'd be telling this story to neighborhood children. It was published in Oziana 1992 with wonderful illustrations by Eric Shanauer. And it's called A Christmas Tree for Dorothy. I should point out that I didn't know there was a Dorothy's Christmas tree comic panel when I wrote this. So I just went for a story that I thought was fun. I hope you'll enjoy it and it'll be kind of in the spirit of the season. There had been a long holiday in Emerald City with parades and banquets, long speeches and dancing in the streets. Ozma had decided that life was getting a bit dull so she declared the new holiday just to liven things up a bit. Everyone had been there for the celebration, but it was over now. So one by one, they were all heading back to their homes with pockets full of presents and baskets full of cakes. Ozma's garden was being slowly put in order by the groundspeople, having been the scene of most of the festivities. They busied about straightening flower beds, raking the grass and trimming the trees. They were in fact so busy that they didn't notice Dorothy at all. She wandered aimlessly around with an occasional sigh and did not at all seem like her usual cheerful self. It was Belina, the yellow hen, that had been with Dorothy since one of her first trips to Oz, who first noticed Dorothy's sadness. Thinking her friend was already beginning to miss the holiday spirit, she quickly fluttered over to Dorothy for a word or two of comfort. There, there now, Dorothy, said the yellow hen. We've had a lovely time all week. You mustn't look so sad just because it's over. Why, we can have another one next week if you'd like. Dorothy looked down at her anxious little friend and smiled. It's nothing like that, Belina, she said, scooping up the hen in her arms. I was just thinking about the holidays back in Kansas and how different they were. But as I recall, said Belina, looking thoughtful, we always ate grand meals and there was dancing and parades and foot races and things in the outside world as well. Yes, but Aunt Em and Uncle Henry and I weren't so well off as lots of people, so we didn't get to go into town to celebrate. As Dorothy was talking, two more of her old friends, the Tin Woodman and Scarecrow, came walking up arm in arm behind her. They were taking one last walk together before returning to their own homes. The Scarecrow had a beautiful castle in the Winky Country, all made of gold that looked like a giant ear of corn. And the Tin Woodman was now living in a great palace, all made of tin in the Winky Country, where he had been crowned emperor. Both of them were ready to leave, having all of their presents packed up in the red wagon and the sawhorse waiting out front to pull it away. At Christmas time, Uncle Henry would look everywhere to find a little pine tree, Dorothy was telling Belina. Then he'd cut it down and bring it home. Aunt Em and I would decorate it with stars. Then we'd all sing songs and eat dinner. The next day, Santa Claus would have left me a present under the tree. But Dorothy, cried Belina. That hardly sounds like any fun at all next to the holidays we have here in Oz. It's not that they were more fun, replied Dorothy. Why, of course, everything is much more beautiful and exciting here. It's just that, I don't know, maybe I just miss the simpler things. It's been a long time since I saw a real Christmas tree. The scarecrow looked at his friend in alarm. Dear Nick, he cried softly, Nick Chopper being his given name. Whatever shall we do? Why, Dorothy has saved our lives over and over. If it weren't for her, I would still be hanging on a pole in a munchkin cornfield. I know, answered his friend. I myself would be rusting away in that forest where she found me. Let's see if we can't think of some way to get her one of those trees. As they walked away thoughtfully, Dorothy and Belina got to talking about the last time Santa Claus had been to Oz. And remembering that day, a grand birthday party for Ozma, most of Dorothy's sadness left her. Soon she was laughing happily again without even realizing she'd been overheard or that her idle words had been taken so seriously. On their way back to the great green palace that stood in the midst of the garden, the tin woodman, I'm sorry, the tin man, I called him the tin man. Baum almost always called him the tin woodman, so I should have put it that way. The tin woodman suddenly cried out in joy. Look there, he pointed for the scarecrow. We can use that tree. There can be a prettier one. And it's right outside Dorothy's window. So we wouldn't even have to cut it down. The scarecrow looked for a moment at the huge tree towering nearly as high as the palace itself and smiled. He knew the tin man's heart was a kind one and that cutting down a tree would have been most difficult for him unless it were being a danger to someone. It was a good thing he was no longer a woodsman. 
Yes, agreed the scarecrow, it is quite beautiful, but a little large. But what can we do about stars? First things first, said the Tin Man. Good afternoon, Mr. Pine Tree, he said, hurrying forward. I am the Tin Man of Oz, Emperor of the Winkies and close friend of Her Majesty, Princess Ozma. I've heard of you often, replied the tree, and even recognize you. But I believe this is the first time we have formally met. I have understood, though, that you were a woodsman, such as cut trees into timber in the woods, not an emperor. Have you given up your uh, former occupation? To be sure, to be sure, answered the tin man quickly. I seldom carry my old axe these days. The tree cringed at the word axe and the tremble of its branches caused a small rain of pine needles to fall to the ground. Then asked the tree hesitantly, what need have you of me? The scarecrow stepped in and introduced himself, then began to explain to the tree the debt he had toward Dorothy and the bit of conversation they had overheard in the garden. I trust you know Princess Dorothy, he eventually asked. Of course, cried the tree. Everyone knows Dorothy here. Why, she's one of our favorite little girls, isn't she? Suddenly, the scarecrow and Tin Man realized that they also were being overheard, for all the trees and flowers about them were nodding in agreement. And, continued the pine tree, if you are asking me to be a Christmas tree for the child, why, I'd consider it an honor. Wonderful, thank you, said the Tin Man, as the scarecrow, echoing his words, danced madly about the garden. Coming back to the Tin Man, the scarecrow stopped short. Excuse me, Mr. Tree, but do you have any ideas as to where we could find some nice stars? Stars? Well, there are all kinds of lovely stars over my head every night, but I'm afraid I'm not tall enough to reach them, he answered. It's just that Dorothy mentioned putting stars on the tree, and we weren't sure how one goes about picking them, explained the Tin Man. But don't worry about it. I'm, I'm sure we'll find a way. I suppose that if you found an exceptionally tall tree, you could climb up and reach some of the lower ones, suggested the tree earnestly. I'm afraid, said the scarecrow, that trees of that height aren't very common in this part of the country. In that case, you'll probably have to try some magic because I know of nothing taller than a tree. As the scarecrow and Tin Man returned to the impatient sawhorse, they worked over the puzzle in their minds. What have you two been doing? asked the sawhorse in an irritated voice. I have been waiting and waiting forever. Now the sawhorse was discovered by the Princess Ozma long ago and was well known to be her favorite steed. He was not used to people who kept him waiting. He looked like any old woodsman sawhorse being a log with four legs fitted in underneath, but he had a twig for a tail and knots for eyes, as well as a fine set of carved ears with which to hear. His feet had been shot in gold so as to keep his legs from wearing down, and as he needed neither food nor sleep and was a tireless runner, he was by far the most agreeable sort of horse one could have. The scarecrow apologized immediately and explained the situation to the sawhorse at once, asking if he had any ideas. Well, really, said the sawhorse, yours is the finest brain in all of Oz. If you can't think of something, how can I? I wish that I could run straight up in the air. I'd have you at the stars in a minute, but I'm afraid that's something I just can't do. That's all right, Sawhorse, said the Tin Man, patting him on his wooden head. No horse can gallop up. We'll find some other way. But wait, that's it, shouted the Scarecrow. There is a horse that can ride us to the stars. High Boy can do it. I'm sure he can, Sawhorse, he said, climbing into the red wagon and pulling Nick in behind. Take us to Uptown as fast as you can go. We need to dock to Joe King at once before it even gets dark. In a flash of color, they were gone. The sawhorse ran at his top speed, which is about as fast as anything can go. The scarecrow clung to Nick to keep from flying off the side, being rather white, light, being rather lightweight and prone to that sort of thing. And Nick clutched the seat with all his might. The wind they caused was so strong they couldn't even talk to each other, for the words blew right out of their mouths and were lost far behind them. They saw little of the countryside, save an occasional streak of purple as they flashed by some little Gillikin town. But they reached Joe King's castle just as the sun began to sink down for the night. The sawhorse drew up to a quick stop right in front of the great purple gate. There, a tall uplander guard recognized them at once and ushered them into the garden where Joe Queen, I'm sorry, Joe King and his Queen Hyacinth were taking an evening walk. Due to their breathless ride, the scarecrow and Tin Man were a little bit stiff and battered. But after a few formal words and bows and things of that nature, the two friends explained their problem to the kindly old king. 
Joe King is the ruler of the Gillikin country and is therefore a pretty important person. He and his wife, Queen Hyacinth, carried a great fondness for Ozma and had always proved more than willing to do whatever they could to help her and her friends. This time again, they were most anxious to lend their horse and to solve the problem at hand. Together, the four hurried off to the royal stable to find High Boy. High Boy is a horse like no other. His legs are like telescopes and they can grow short or long as the need arises. He's especially handy in the mountains for he can walk up a cliff as if it were a flight of steps or adjust his legs going up and down the hill in such a way that his riders always have a level ride. Just outside the stable door, they found High Boy deep in conversation with a young groomsman who was giving him a brushing. He was standing about as low as he could, his legs being about a foot long, because his Gillikin groom was not very tall. When the king and those with him approached, he shot up to standard horse size, causing the little Gillikin to topple over backwards in the fright. Hi, boy, began the scarecrow as Joe King helped the groomsman to his feet. We have a big favor to ask of you because no one but you can help us. Well, you know I'm most always willing to help, replied the horse, ask away. It seems that Dorothy has been feeling a little blue lately because she misses a rather odd tradition from the outside world, explained the Tin Man. Back in Kansas, people would decorate trees with stars and sing songs around them. We decided to try and do that for her here in Ozma's garden, and we've even found a nice tree, but now we need to pick some stars. And, interrupted the horse, you want me to ride you up to the stars. Exactly, said the scarecrow, as the Tin Man King and Queen nodded. Can you go up that high? Well, I could probably go up higher if I had a mind to, he replied. When shall we go? Oh, you're seeing a little bit of a picture. This is the next page. I'll show you this one when we get to it. Uh, when should we go? The sooner the better, as far as we're concerned, said the Tin Man. Is there any reason we can't go tonight? High Boy looked up at the darkening sky overhead. A few stars were beginning to shine. Without a spoken answer, he lowered himself to the ground and said, climb on. Excited, they found his saddle in the stables and managed to get it on his back. Joe King called for a rope and tied the two securely into place. He knew how easy it would be for such lightweight characters to fall off as they zipped up and down. Warnings and encouragements passed back and forth along with lots of good luck wishes. Then slowly, High Boy began to lengthen his legs. One other thing that makes High Boy different from all the other horses in the world is his tail. It's an umbrella. When the rain pours down or the sun is too hot, High Boy can raise up his umbrella tail and protect the riders on his back. Now he opened his tail over the heads of the Tin Man and Scarecrow to fend off the rush of wind that grew faster and harder as his legs grew longer. The Tin Man and Scarecrow sat still and gazed around them. The silence and the darkness all around added to the growing speed with which they traveled made this ride like none they had ever known before. Both of them were made in such a way that they didn't have to worry about breathing the high air the way a flesh and blood person would. And they were tied on securely enough so they didn't have to fear falling to the ground either, both of which made the ride even better. High Boy stopped when he reached a point where there were lots of pretty stars within easy reach. Closing and lowering his tail, he told the Scarecrow and Tin Man to start picking nice ones, and if they needed more, to just say so, and he'd take them up still higher. Looking overhead and all around, the Scarecrow suddenly realized something. We've forgotten to bring a sack or a basket to put them in, he cried in dismay. What can we do? Well, said the Tin Man thoughtfully, I'm as hollow as a man can be inside, but I haven't an opening to put them through. We could pull out some of my stuffing and put them in my chest, suggested the Scarecrow helpfully. I can always get new straw when we get back. Don't go tearing yourselves apart about it, interrupted High Boy. Why don't I just open my tail a little bit without raising it and you can fill it with stars. That seemed like the best idea they had. So High Boy opened his tail partway and the Tin Man and Scarecrow began filling it with stars. And that's this great picture, Eric. Here's that open umbrella as Scarecrow and Tin Man pick stars for it. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Now I've got to find where I was. High Boy helped by swaying back and forth to bring some that were particularly pretty into easier reach. They picked many, many stars in pretty shades of palest blue, green, and pink, as well as the more common white and yellow. 
As each little ball of light fell from their hands, the pile inside the umbrella tail grew and grew until at last it was one beautiful glowing mass. Then it was time to go back home for their mission in the sky had been completed. High Boy began to shorten his legs slowly. Soon the stars were high above them again and they were moving faster and faster. Now about the time they reached cloud level, it had become quite dark on the earth and it happened that the Sandman was on his way home. He was flying along, minding his own business when he saw High Boy's, High Boy's long legs towering up in front of him. Fortunately, he recognized the famous high horse, so he pulled himself to a stop to say hello, realizing that High Boy was on his way down. Unfortunately, High Boy didn't know that the little shadowy figure he saw below him was a friend. So he swayed with a jerk to one side to keep from hitting him. And when he swayed, the wind caught his tail and turned it inside out. All the stars began to, dance, to rain down around them. Everyone so carefully picked fell like a drop of glistening water to the earth. When they came at last to Joe King's garden, it was completely covered with scattered stars. They spread everywhere on the ground, almost as far as you could see. They looked beautiful, glittering in the grass, but to the scarecrow and tin man, it was a disaster, for it would take hours to retrieve them all again. High boy hung his head. I'm so sorry, he told his friends. I only dodged aside to miss that little person who was flying by up there. I had no idea this would happen. Isn't there something we can do? I suppose we could go do it all over again, said the Tin Man with a sigh. But then we'd still have all these stars scattered around on the grass tomorrow and everyone would want to know why. The farmers wouldn't be able to farm. The animals might be afraid to graze, pointed out the scarecrow. Excuse me, said a small voice behind them. Can I be of some assistance here? Tin Man, cried the scarecrow, running over to greet his old friend. Was that you up there? We had no idea. Why, I haven't seen you for the longest time. That's because you have no need of me, he replied smiling. What has happened here? We were picking stars for a Christmas tree for Dorothy and they all spilled, explained the Tin Man mournfully. Now we don't know what to do because it will take us all a long time to pick them all up again, yet we can't just leave them here. Do you have any ideas? Asked High Boy. Let me think, replied the Sandman, scratching his chin. I could keep everyone sleeping for several days until we got them all picked up. No one seemed to like that idea. Well, then maybe my magic mistake bag would help, he continued. Magic mistake bag? Why, I've never heard of that, said the scarecrow. Do you remember the time I saw Ozma's castle and thought it was in a dream, so I put everyone in it to sleep? Except for the two of you. Asked the Sandman. The Tin Man and Scarecrow nodded, so he went on. Well, some time ago, I got to thinking that something like that might happen again. So I spoke with your friend, the Wizard of Oz, and I had him make me this bag. Here, he pulled a small bag out of his coat pocket and held it up for them to see. With this, I can pick up dust that I've scattered about at the wrong time or place. Maybe it'll work to gather up your lost stars. Without waiting to hear their answer, the Sandman picked up his feet and flew off with his bag held open before him. The stars seemed to jump right off the ground in their hurry to get into his magic bag. He flew around so quickly that they couldn't even see him, except for the dark paths in the grass where the stars had been. That's another great picture Eric drew. So fun to have him do a story for me. Um, now where'd I go? I'm sorry, I shouldn't have marked my place before I went back to show you that picture. Um, so then, back and forth he went until the ground was all dark again and his bag overflowing with light. High Boy trotted over to the stables and came back carrying a fine feed bag to hold the stars. Emptying the Sandman's special bag, they thanked him over and over again. Nothing to it, he answered. Why, if it hadn't been for me, they would never have been spilt in the first place. Give my regards to Ozma and wish Dorothy the pleasantest of dreams. With a small jump, he was off again, leaving High Boy, the Tin Man, and the Scarecrow all alone in the darkness of the garden. It looks like you two need to be getting back now, said High Boy with a yawn. Would you like me to give you a lift? Thank you, High Boy. But I believe the sawhorse should still be around if we can just find him, said the Tin Woodman. I'll find him for you, offered High Boy. He promptly shot himself up 40 feet and was just as rapidly back beside them. He's wandering around the other side of that hedge, the horse saw told him the red wagon is next to the stable. 
Thank you, said the Scarecrow. There are certainly advantages to being tall. Glad to be of service to you. Let me know how the party goes, said High Boy, as he headed back to sleep away, to sleep away what was left of the night. The sawhorse was found at last, and as they hitched him to the red wagon, they told him all about their ride into the sky, the different adventures they had had. Then, in a final wild ride, they returned to the Emerald City to hang the stars on Dorothy's tree before she woke up. Reaching the tree they had chosen to be Dorothy's, they were surprised to find it covered with all sorts of colored glass balls and pink and white candy canes. As they gazed at it wondering, a very familiar old man stepped out from behind and walked towards them smiling. Scarecrow, Tin Man, cried Santa Claus. I haven't seen you since Ozma's birthday party. But, but, stammered the Scarecrow. Oh, you mean all this, said Santa, as his arm made a sweeping motion toward the tree. It was the Sandman. He stopped by this evening to tell me you were making a Christmas tree for little Dorothy. So I got a few things together to come join the fun. I understand you two have been out picking real stars. Yes, that's right. High boy took us up, answered the Tin Man, holding up the bag. Why, that will be beautiful, said Santa, after letting out a long whistle through his teeth. I had a few little elves around here a while ago to help me hang all these things. As soon as they get back, I'll have them go to work with these stars. We'll have the prettiest Christmas tree Dorothy ever saw. In a few moments, a half a dozen little elves appeared and shortly they were to be seen climbing about in the tree, hanging the sparkling stars all around. The light reflected on the glass balls that Santa had brought along until the entire tree seemed to glow. Santa whispered a few of his magic words that caused the stars to shine just as brightly in the day as in the night. And then they all stood back and watched the tree as the sun rose behind it. The sky was a mass of shining color when Dorothy's little dog Toto started to bark madly inside the palace. He ran from her bedside to the window and back repeatedly until she pulled on her nightgown and followed him to see what all the commotion was about. Pushing aside the curtain that blocked her view of the garden, she gasped in surprise. Santa Claus called up to her to be quick about getting downstairs as he might have to give her present to someone else. So she ran right down without so much as pulling on her slippers. By the time Dorothy reached the garden, there were already a great number of people around talking and staring at the tree. Everyone was very excited and the noise they made was waking up the few people left inside. Is it Christmas? asked Dorothy, too excited to even know what it was she meant to say. It is for you, dear, cried Santa smiling, said Santa smiling. Your two friends here, he pointed at the Tin Man and Scarecrow, heard you saying that you wanted to have a Christmas tree, and so they decided to make one for you. Do you like it, Dorothy? asked the Tin Man. We tried our hardest, and Santa said it was just fine. Did we make it like Kansas? asked the Scarecrow hesitantly. Kansas? Fine, said Dorothy indignantly. Why, it's a lot better than that. I've never seen a more beautiful Christmas tree in my whole life. It's perfect. We never had anything this nice in Kansas. Oh, but you're forgetting something, Dorothy, said Santa, laughing her outburst. Don't you want your present? Dorothy looked at him and bit her lip as she stared at the big box in Santa's arms. He'd left it under the tree, so she hadn't even noticed it at all. What is it? she asked, touching the big red bow shyly. Why, Dorothy, this isn't just any old present. It's a magic one, and it's whatever you want it to be. I'm afraid I don't understand, Santa, she said. I couldn't think of anything you might want or need that you didn't already have, so I enchanted this box. Now you hold it, he said, giving it to her, and wish for something. And inside, that's just what you'll find. Oh, I'll wish for a fruitcake full of raisins and nuts like Aunt Em used to make back home. Then it will really be like Christmas, said Dorothy, opening the box quickly. Everyone let out a big sigh as they saw the cake. For a moment, Dorothy looked concerned. Can I wish again, Santa, so there'll be enough to go around? You certainly can, he answered. You can wish all you like, then give it to someone else and they can wish on it too. As long as it's given as a gift, it will always answer wishes. So Dorothy wished again and again until there were all manner of good things to eat for the growing crowd. Then she gave it to Ozma, who wished for a few faraway friends to be there. Then the Scarecrow thought hard and wished for pleasant dreams for Dorothy because he remembered that the Sandman had asked him to. The Tin Man wished for the candy canes to never end because they all seemed to be disappearing fast. And Jellia Jam wished all the dishes clean because as a maid in the palace, she thought of things. One by one, everybody got to make wishes until they were all wished out. Then Santa taught them all Christmas songs that they sang around the tree. 
making everyone happy, especially Dorothy, who, surrounded by loving friends, found that all her wishes had come true. It's a great concluding illustration. So that is my little Christmas story from Ozzyana 1992. I'm glad I could share it with you during this Christmas season. Gosh, 30 years almost later. It's been really fun being a part of this 50 years 50 story celebration of Ozzyana for the International Wizard of Oz Club here on YouTube. I hope you've listened to more stories. If you haven't, go back and listen. We've been doing one every week. And uh, Look for our publications to come. We'll continue doing Asiana as long as we keep getting stories for it. If you write your own original stories, I hope you'll consider um, entering them in the Oz Club's annual contests. And from there, all the entries uh, get passed to our Asiana editor for consideration for publication. Doesn't mean they'll wind up published, but you just never know. We're also always looking for illustrators for the publication. So if you write or illustrate your own Oz stories in the tradition of L. Frank Baum, meaning, you know, children's stories that take place in Oz, we would love to hear from you. That's it for today. Thank you so much. And I hope you enjoyed my story.